Good morning and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. We'll be discussing the newest report from Forest Trends Ecosystem Marketplace entitled State of Private Investment in Conservation 2016, a Landscape Assessment of an Emerging Market. Uh, my name is Will Tucker. I'm the Senior Communications Associate in Forest Trends and I'll be acting as your moderator today. I'm joined on the line by my colleague Kelly Hamrick, who's the Senior Associate at Forest Trends Ecosystem Marketplace and the author of the newest report. Adam Davis, who is Managing Partner at Ecosystem Investment Partners, and Edit Kiss, Director of Business Development and Operations at Ecosphere Capital Partners, LLP. Uh, without being too long-winded, I'll give you a few notes on the GoToWebinar software and format. Today's webinar is scheduled for one hour. We'll begin with a presentation from our report author, Kelly, before Adam and Edit lend some insights of their own. We're hoping to set aside about 15 minutes or so for Q&A at the end. For those not familiar with the GoToWebinar software, all participants are muted by default, so we don't have too much background noise or interference. Uh, many of you are most likely using the VOIP audio over your computer, but if you find the audio quality to be poor, you might want to try calling in. If you select use the uh, select the phone call button, it will knock you off of audio over your computer and give you a phone number and passcode pen uh, with which you can use to call in. Uh, for questions, you can uh, submit a written question via the question box at any point during the uh, webinar. If for whatever reason you'd prefer to ask the question verbally, you'll notice there's an option to raise your hand in the, uh, the dashboard to your right. Um, I'll unmute individual callers to ask their questions in the order in which they raise their hand, uh, but the easiest way is, is to use that written question box and uh, you can submit those questions at any point during the webinar, it won't distract the presenters and we'll go ahead and ask those in the, the order in which they're received. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, hand things over to uh, my colleague Kelly Hamrick. Great, thank you Will. So as Will mentioned, this is the uh, State of Private Investment and Conservation 2016 report. This is actually the second report in this series, but the first time Ecosystem Marketplace has been uh, in the lead for it. So there was one that came out two years ago that was done by Eco Assets, now Encouraged Capital, and the Nature Conservancy. So before I begin, I would like to recognize the Advisory Council uh, members who are listed here who provided invaluable guidance and feedback on this report over the past year. And also I wanted to uh, briefly go over Ecosystem Marketplace for those of you who are unfamiliar with us. We are an initiative of Forest Trends, and while many Forest Trends programs work on the ground implementing new projects or policies, we provide a more macro overview of environmental finance trends and data. So specifically, our work focuses on collecting and disseminating information on environmental markets, typically through reports, newsletters, articles, and more. So this is, as I just mentioned, the second report tracking private investment and conservation. But what do we even mean by that? So we define conservation investments as having met two criteria. The investment had to intend to generate profit while also intending to have a conservation impact. That is, uh, the conservation must have, been motiv must have motivated the investment from the outset. It could not simply be a byproduct of an investment made solely for financial return. We then further divided conservation investments into three broad categories, which is what you can see on the slide here. That is sustainable food and fiber, which includes sustainable forestry, agriculture, fisheries, and more habitat conservation, which includes direct land ownership, forest carbon, mitigation banking, and more. And finally, water quality and quantity, which includes water rights treating, stormwater management, watershed protection, and more. So I'll be referring to these throughout the presentation as conservation categories and to the specific inv uh, investment interventions, like sustainable forestry, as subcategories. So who responded to our survey? This slide gives you some context about where our results came from. In total, we had 98 for-profit or not-for-profit organizations provide quantitative data out of a broader pool of 128 respondents. And as you can see on this map, our respondents tilt very heavily towards the US. So the dark blue color uh, means that the country had 10 or more respondents. Um, and Though we made a strong effort to collect international responses, you can tell that few countries produced even four to five respondents, which is 
shown here on the map in a light blue color. And then if you look at the chart below, it tells you what types of respondents we had. And you can see that the majority, 45 respondents, were fund managers, which is the yellow, uh, followed by corporations, NGOs, and then foundations. Family offices and high net worth individuals made up a growing number of respondents. We tracked uh, 10 this past year, up from three in 2014. And while a handful of pension funds have made known investments into conservation funds or companies, uh, none responded to the survey. So what did we track? Uh, investors reported committing $8.2 billion in total. And as you can see, this graph is showing two things here. The light green line shows the cumulative capital committed uh, with the scale on the right, beginning with $0.9 billion tracked in the 2014 report, and then adding additional information we collected across 2009 to 2015 uh, for this most recent total of $8.2 billion uh, cumulative. Meanwhile, the dark green bars show the average capital committed per year by time period. So the two leftmost columns show the average annual capital committed across 2004 to 2008 and across 2009 to 2013, whereas the right two columns simply show the capital committed in each of the single years of 2014 and 2015. So as you can see here, the total capital committed on average has more than doubled. Uh, from $0.8 billion from 2009 to 2013 to $2 billion ca uh, committed in 2015 alone. So where are investors directing this capital? Uh, this graph shows the total capital committed by conservation category and by the yearly uh, time periods with the averages once again for 2004 to 2008 and 2009 to 2013. Uh, so as you can see, the bulk of finance is going towards sustainable food and fiber. Investors reported committing $6.5 billion in capital towards sustainable food and fiber production across all years. And this is uh, nearly four times as much capital reported than was reported for habitat conservation and water quality and quantity sectors combined. And within that, the bulk of investment overwhelmingly went to either sustainable agriculture or sustainable forestry. Those two subcategories made up 95% of all capital invested in this category. And I haven't included uh, a more detailed breakdown of the subcategories here, but um, just so you all know, that is included in the report. And so then if you, if you turn your attention to uh, the middle part of this graph that shows habitat conservation, and investors committed uh, $1.3 billion across all years. These organizations typically favored real asset investment in the U.S. through direct land ownership and to a smaller extent uh, land easements. And uh, there was also capital committed towards forest carbon and mitigation banking, which typically re relied on a mixture of revenue, including the sale of environmental credits um, and also more internationally focused investments. And then finally, as you can see on the, on the right, um, we have not seen any clear sign of growth yet for water quality and quantity, and investors committed smaller amounts of capital that totals only 5% of all conservation investments tracked across all years and across all categories. So while most of the survey respondents came from North America or Europe, we tracked a growing amount of capital committed in other continents. So what this graph is showing is a map of where capital is going for sustainable food and fiber for production and balance only. Uh, we do have similar maps for habitat conservation and water quality and quantity. So as you can see here, the majority of capital went to North America, that was 33%, followed by 29% going to Latin America and 19% going to Oceania. And the remaining 18% was split pretty evenly between Africa and Asia. One thing to keep in mind with this particular figure is that we did have a large Latin American response. Uh, from a single respondent in 2015, so that should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but even without that response, sustainable food and fiber production commitments are still much more internationally focused than uh, the other two conservation categories. So in habitat conservation, almost all, all investment remained domestic to the U.S., with the exception of forest carbon commitments, which typically focused uh, on tropical countries. And similarly, water quality and quantity commitments remained very uh, U.S. focused as well with the exception of some activity tracked in Australia. So we can't name names here, but there are some insights we can give 
to the investor response rate. So this figure shows a couple of things. If you take a look at the pie chart, uh, the dark teal shows how much capital the top 10 organizations committed from 2009 to 2015, uh, and that was 66% of, of all capital tracked. Meanwhile, the remaining light blue $2.3 billion is capital committed by the remaining 88 organizations. So we provided a breakdown of all 98 private investors that provided us with commitment data um, in the section below. And you can see the size of the commitments that these organizations made across all years. So one dot equals one organization. Uh, so the way you would read this is that one organization has committed over $1 billion, whereas three have committed between half a billion and one billion. Uh, meanwhile, the bulk of organizations have committed between 10 to 100 million um, across all the years that we've tracked this. So it's all well and good to say that finance is flowing to conservation, but the big question on everyone's minds is usually, does this pay off? Uh, so unfortunately, I can't directly answer that question. While we did uh, ask about actual IRR, uh, most respondents to our survey were um, not interested in disclosing that information. Uh, but what this chart is showing is uh, anticipated IRR. So uh, the chart splits out the response by profit type because we found a an interesting difference in the data. So as you can see, uh, not-for-profit respondents, which include NGOs and foundations, typically cited uh, 0 to 4.9 percent as their projected return. In contrast, 32 percent of for-profit respondents cited 5 to 9.9 percent as the most common return, followed by 27 percent anticipating returns between 10 to 14.9 percent and a further 31% anticipating returns of 15% or greater. So this lines up with what we know about investor motivation and criteria when committing capital. For-profit respondents tended to rank financial return and conservation outcome as equally important objectives, while not-for-profits tended to heavily prioritize conservation outcomes over uh, financial profit. So far, I've discussed our financial findings, but I think it is equally important to know whether or not the investment is actually benefiting conservation. So what this graph shows are three pie charts showing the breakdown of organizations that measure conservation impact uh, across 2009 to 2013, in 2014, and in 2015. So the top right section shows the percent of organizations using their own internal criteria. The bottom right shows the percent of organizations using a third-party standard or certification body. And the gray color on the left shows the percent of organizations who chose not to respond to this particular question. So as you can see, organizations that monitor or track conservation impact over time uh, have increased. So in 2015, respondents reported the highest use of monitoring and reporting with 35% using internal criteria and 23% using a third-party certification or standard. Um, and one of the interesting things as well that you can see here is that the number of respondents developing or relying on their own internal metrics for tracking uh, conservation has increased faster than those using a third-party uh, criteria. However, as you can also see very clearly in this figure, a large number of respondents did, simply did not report on whether or not they collected sustainability data. So while this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that they are not collecting this data, it certainly underlines the need for more transparency around um, these investments. And another side note here, this is one of several figures we have on conservation impacts. We added a couple of new questions this year, um, and some of those include the motivation for measuring conservation, and uh, a couple of questions were also framed around specific metrics investors use to track progress by subcategory outcomes, so for example, for sustainable forestry specifically. So one final finding that surprised us from private investors uh, is that in addition to committing $2 billion in 2015 alone, respondents also indicated that they have already raised but not deployed another $3.1 billion. So they also gave us some indication of where that capital would likely flow. So while most capital is tied up for sustainable food and fiber production, that's $1.4 billion, uh, it is surprising to note that nearly an equal amount of $1.1 billion is in the wings for habitat conservation. And uh, another interesting finding is that 
the amount set aside for water quality and quantity, half a billion, is more than what we have tracked for this category for the past 12 years, which is 0.4 billion. So overall, we believe that this indicates there is not necessarily a shortage of money out there, but rather a shortage of investable deals. And this also matches what respondents ranked as barriers to growth. They listed a lack of attractive risk return deals, small transaction sizes, and management track records as key limitations. And finally, we also asked respondents if they plan to fundraise or reallocate more capital in 2016 to 2018 uh, than what they've done in the past three years from 2013 to 2015. And all but three respondents said that they um, plan to fundraise or reallocate either the same amount or more capital in the next three years. Uh, so we have a lot of other findings in this report, but I wanted to sort of end with a couple of uh, emerging trends and developments that we're keeping an eye on. Um, of course, the, the one, two caveats I'd like to have at the beginning uh, deal with the scope of what our report actually tracks. Uh, so we probably captured, we're estimating, we captured about one-third of estimated activity. Um, while our response rate more than doubled from the 2014 survey, we still know of additional organizations that did not respond, and, and I'd estimate that at about 200. Um, interestingly, the one number I, I found most most interesting was that we did track 48, or we did reach out to 48 organizations who told us that they currently do not invest in conservation, uh, but told us to get back in touch in the future because they plan to move into this space. Uh, the other sort of key consideration around scope is that we do have a fairly narrow definition of conservation. Um, so this did include investments, for example, um, around cook stoves, clean cook stoves. So if an organization was investing in clean cook stoves and reducing the amount of firewood needed, but it was in an urban area and we couldn't tell where the uh, reduced need for firewood was coming from, then we would not count that as something that was enhancing conservation. Whereas a project, a cook stove project that is actually in a rural area where um, the participants get their firewood from a nearby forest that perhaps is you know, a protected area, that's a much clearer link and so that would be counted. Um, so that's just one sort of example of, of how we um, sort of drew the line on what counted as a conservation investment or not. Uh, and then some of the other emerging trends and developments we have our eye on. Um, one is, of course, that sustainable food, forestry, and agriculture investment seems to be growing in emerging economies. Uh, another is that um, while we did not track a whole lot of investment going to sustainable fisheries or aquaculture up until 2015, uh, there seem to be new financial models appearing, especially in the past year in this field. Uh, and finally, that we think uh, investment in water is growing. Uh, it may double from historical amounts, though I would caution that that's simply showing what organizations intend to do, but does not necessarily predict what they will do. And finally, three more points to end with. One is that um, we are seeing institutional investors beginning to invest in conservation, typically in the bigger or sort of longer term funds. Um, and we've heard sort of at a more strategic level that they are interested in longer term evergreen approaches. Um, though at the moment that I think is still very much just talk and not action. And also we did interviews with many companies um, trying to figure out if corporate commitments around carbon or supply chains would begin to drive internal investing. At the moment we haven't seen a whole lot of activity around this front, um, but there are a few examples around, for example, IKEA and Starbucks uh, of companies who are doing this, and so it's something we'll keep an eye on in the future. And then finally, uh, public institutions are, um, we're seeing them move from beyond risk mitigation into trying to more directly invest in conservation or create markets or um, sort of engage with the private sector in a number of other roles. So thank you so much for your time. I've only touched on a couple of the key findings in this report. Uh, in addition to greater analysis, we also did a number of case studies that highlight and explain current trends and innovations we're seeing in this space. Um, so I would highly encourage you to uh, take a further look if you are interested. Uh, so thank you. And, and with that, I think I will um, let uh, Adam Davis take the, take the floor. Uh, 
Um, Adam, I, I realize you're joining us by phone, so I just want to remind you to make sure your um, your phone isn't isn't muted. Oh, thank you very much. Let me uh, start again. Oh yeah, no problem. We've, we've got uh, you live cleared out. Um, good morning, everyone. Kelly, thanks for that excellent presentation, and uh, uh, for the very good work on the private investment uh, report. Uh, it's edifying and interesting to see the growth in the field, and uh, we appreciate the hard work. Um, I'm going to make some comments this morning on the presentation. I'll start with a little bit of background on our company, which is Ecosystem Investment Partners. Uh, I'll make a few comments on the categories of investment that are described in the report, and then make some general observations about um, sort of where our particular corner of the market is going. So I'm a managing partner with uh, Ecosystem Investment Partners. Uh, we're based in Baltimore. We were founded in 2007. And um, we are a private equity fund structure that invests in wetlands, stream, and habitat restoration. Uh, we've raised about a half a billion dollars, uh, most of it since 2012, and are actively investing our third fund in a set of properties around the United States that generate uh, compensatory mitigation under the Clean Water Act and other environmental values that customers want to buy. Uh, our investors are primarily institutional investors, including pension funds both in the US and Europe, uh, as well as uh, large university and foundation endowments, and then uh, some high net worth uh, family offices. Um, the uh, the industry that we work in, we actually describe as the restoration industry, not the conservation industry, uh, because w what we sell is essentially scientifically verified units of uplift from a baseline. So we look for degraded properties. We invest in the restoration of those properties back to ecological health. And the, how we are judged on performance, the metrics for performance, are very rigorous uh, government-defined uh, third-party uh, measurements uh, for uh, various aspects of wetland health. If you look at our uh, wetland stream or habitat health, if you, if you look at our website, you'll see a very sort of high-level graphic on the overall performance of our investments from an environmental point of view. And we simply track for the public uh, acres protected and conserved, uh, stream miles restored, uh, number of trees planted, very, very sort of high-level metrics. And I just wanted to comment on that, that one of the reasons we don't provide, uh, you know, more rigorous detail in a public setting is not that there's anything private about the results. It's simply that the results vary so much by type of investment and type of ecosystem uh, the, the ways that were measured for wetland health in a coastal marsh restoration project in Louisiana, for example, are almost entirely different than how we're judged for uh, restoring Appalachian streams uh, that were damaged by strip mining. There's just a whole different set of metrics. Uh, the metrics are often very complicated, uh, pages and pages of details um, with all sorts of various scientific uh, criteria that are used to evaluate uplift. So while I would argue that the kinds of standards that we're held to for environmental performance are extremely rigorous, uh, they're not easy to sort of roll up into a package and say, you know, sort of, here's what happened from an overall set of investments. Uh, much easier to look at performance from an individual uh, project, if you will. Um, a general comment, and this is highlighted in the report, uh, uh, that Kelly authored um, about sort of trends. Uh, investor education is much less necessary for this sector uh, than it has been in the past. We started raising our first fund in 2007, as I mentioned. At that time, there was very little awareness in the institutional investor community about sort of mitigation banking or restoration investment. and. Um, we often had to go back for several meetings with individual uh, firms or entities considering investment um, with lots and lots of due diligence and background. Uh, these days, um, 
there's a lot more awareness. Uh, the, the sort of the, the word has gotten around that uh, um, mitigation banking in the United States is an investable activity. There's sufficient predictability in the overall structure that a pro forma can be written for an individual investment. Uh, and really, you know, good analysis and due diligence can be done on uh, on environmental considerations and, and return considerations. So various investors have different motives, but there's a lot less uh, time that's spent in basic education now. Um, one other comment I wanted to make is about the distinction in the report between sort of habitat uh, conservation versus water. Um, as two major categories of investment. While I think that probably is true for some entities, we actually don't tend to think of it that way. Uh, water quality is a huge motivator for a number of our customers. We're working directly on stream restoration specifically to produce reductions in nutrients and sediments in some places. Uh, and obviously the structural work that we do on streams um, produces water quality benefits as well. Um, we also don't think our, of ourselves as conservation investors. We really think of ourselves as restoration practitioners, as I mentioned before. And I think uh, you're going to be seeing that reflected not just in our own thinking, but in the National Trade Association of Companies that works in this space. Uh, we are now known as the National Mitigation Banking Association. but uh, people in the industry now are thinking of themselves and describing themselves as the restoration industry uh, because it more accurately describes what we do. Um, there are about a hundred large companies uh, in the National Mitigation Banking Association today and there's a lot of growing, uh, there's a lot of growth going on, it's pretty evident. Um, as I said earlier, we've raised about a half a billion dollars now, um, a hundred percent focused on uh, wetland stream and habitat restoration. Um, and uh, one of our larger competitors was just uh, purchased by KKR, a uh, very large private equity firm. And there's been a number of other notable mergers and acquisitions in the space. So the amount of attention from large scale capital to the returns that can be made through restoration, I think is a really important and growing uh, aspect of overall sort of impact investment. Um, so then some final comments. Um, this new capacity and energy in the sector is leading to some changes in the trade association uh, that are important to note. The NMBA has a new executive director and the NMBA is going to be holding its first ever policy conference in Washington DC uh, coming up on March 22nd. So you might do a Google search for that and attend if you can. It's going to be a very interesting dialogue with the new Trump administration and others in D.C. about the benefits of the approach taken by our sector um, to essentially enabling infrastructure, energy, and uh, permits for shovel-ready projects uh, without lowering environmental standards. There'll be plenty of pressure to lower environmental standards, um, but plenty of pushback on that as well. And the type of solution that our industry offers, uh, which is essentially rigorous standards that are demonstrably cutting permit times in half, using private capital and creating jobs uh, is uh, something that we are going to try and get as much currency out of as possible. Um, uh, I want to note one last thing, which is that this theme of jobs is not a new one. It's something we've been talking about as an industry and as a company for some time. Uh, University of uh, North Carolina uh, recently published a peer-reviewed study uh, in an online journal called Plus One, which, um, which shows that over 221,000 jobs and about $25 billion in economic activity each year are created through restoration activities. Uh, and that's restoration fairly narrowly defined. That means there's more jobs in ecological restoration than there are in the steel industry or in the coal industry. Uh, and these are actually good jobs that pay living wages, uh, often in rural areas of the country. So there is uh, 
a, a lot of argument as to why we should get consideration along with other industries, and we're going to be making those arguments as forcefully as we can. So that's uh, maybe more than you bargained for, but those are my comments for this morning. That's, that's tremendous. Thank you, uh, Adam. That uh, really adds a lot of color to, to the report that, that Kelly and Ecosystem Marketplace have put out, and, um, and your perspective is, is much appreciated. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand off now to Edit, who will um, be presenting some slides of her own. Hello. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not sure. Is my slide on the screen? Yes, we've got your slides. If you just want to go into um, presentation mode, edit. Exactly. That's why it doesn't. Um, okay. So you got it. Great. So thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here um, and uh, participate in this webinar and uh, reflect on the report as well. Um, I'll also have an introduction in the next uh, five minutes or so about our work and uh, we'll have some reflections uh, as well and conclusions. So who we are, uh, Altilia Ecosphere is um, an impact investment fund manager. Uh, we based in, we're registered in Luxembourg. Our, our investment uh, advisor officer is offices in, in London, he's in the UK. And really our uh, objective is um, to channel finance to conservation activities at scale in tropical forest countries where we think there is a big urgency and need we want to uh, achieve um, the two degrees uh, climate change target or do something about the mass extinction of species where we are at the, at the moment um, and so really we do that by designing innovative products that allow the capital to flow to conservation um, because I totally agree with the also uh, conclusion or remark in the report, there is enough capital um, available. Um, capital markets, they, uh, there is about 170 trillion uh, US dollar assets, uh, so one, only if 1% uh, to, to, would go to conservation, uh, we would have the um, the uh, need, the, the demand field, uh, and so there is a lot of capital. It's just difficult to channel that into the ground. So Altilia was set up to to provide that bridge between the, the ground, the field of small scale indeed uh, project, projects that need structuring and aggregating and, and the institutional investors. Uh, we work with a large um, a set of large investors, both public and private. Um, obviously started off with uh, the public uh, DFIs was, was easier, so our first um, funds uh, first closed in 2013 included uh, investors like the European Investment Fund, the Dutch Development Bank, um, and then some private uh, company, private banks that came on uh, for the second close, uh, partly also thanks to our uh, innovative um, first of its kind, a guarantee with the US uh, government, um, which is one of the, the structures we put in place, um, uh, underwriting 50% of the, the, the portfolio um, performance uh, on the forest uh, for carbon credits, which was the first ever uh, for the US, USAID. Um, we also have structured um, with uh, Credit Suisse, uh, an innovative nature conservation note, which allows for, for, for the first time high net worth individuals to tap into this uh, upcoming conservation uh, market. Um, and these two instruments helped, uh, again, our first fund, which is the Altidia Climate Fund, which is a 100, euro, 100 million euro fund to, 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 to be launched. Um, and since then, most recently, we also have secured a 35 million commitment from the Green Climate Fund to see our Madagascar Sustainable Landscape Fund, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit uh, later, and I think was also featured in the um, featured in the um, report. Um, again, uh, just uh, showing our partners. This is an extremely complicated um, landscape. Uh, tropical forest countries are emerging, emerging markets are quite, uh, I guess, different than um, than uh, more mature markets, and uh, so this is something we can't do alone. We would, we have been working a lot with a uh, conservation international, our funding partner, um, again USAID with a guarantee and and public and private investors. 
wanted to highlight that um, we believe that actually this type of civil society, um, public and private corporations will be uh, quite key uh, in the future as well to, to scale up uh, the conservation finance, uh, especially working on, on, the, on the pipeline investable projects um, and leveraging uh, um, uh, better public finance in, in terms of, for example, the blended, blended structure, blended finance structures, etc. Um, on the next slide, just uh, very quickly, um, on, on for our Atelier Climate Fund, uh, a small, uh, the model uh, we use is, is based on uh, multiple revenue streams. Um, uh, so we have been one of the pioneering uh, this uh, production protection model, whereby we combine conservation, uh, typically through payment for ecosystem services, of which the most advanced is Red Plus carbon credits, uh, with uh, sustainable, traceable, sustainable certified commodities uh, like agroforestry, fine flavor cacao or coffee, um, and thereby providing diversified revenue streams uh, to the investors. Um, this we have been doing through loan uh, instruments, um, qualified by carbon credits and some other type of assets um, like cattle in, in our Brazil uh, program, uh, which is often a, a, an issue for traditional investors to come into this space, the lack of collateral. Um, we use the payment for performance um, principle and uh, our first fund is operating for eight years, so that's why it's um, uh, about five to seven years, depending on the time of the investment. Um, that, that's the first uh, model we. Uh, that, that's the model we have been using in the first fund, and and, and found quite uh, interesting and, and able to um, to uh, scale and, and and working for the our next uh, funds as well. Um, just a, a, a quick slide on our impacts, um, and then the next one. I, I, I totally agree with Adam. The difficulties of aggregating and uh, System, measuring systematically on a fund level uh, impact. We, however, came up with a, um, our, our own uh, internal framework uh, based on uh, looking at all the existing um, systems in place, uh, the SDGs, the gene, all other frameworks that are there, and, and came up with those that are the most relevant for our area of work, um, and measuring uh, the impacts around seven thematic areas. Climate, uh, it's quite, it's a, I mean, the easiest on around the CO2 uh, equivalent savings uh, for the species, ecosystems, um, or the area of, of, of ecosystems that are connected or, or preserved, the species also the uh, especially the red lead species, uh, the conservation status uh, it be, it gets improved. Uh, livelihoods obviously are some again easier, like number of jobs created, still enterprise, fair economic return, and inclusivity. So um, this has been going quite, going quite well with our in, for our investors. Uh, we are uh, not a charity, obviously. We are looking for financial return, uh, but also our investors look for social and environmental. Um, dividend and uh, very interested in, in, in the quantifi quantified uh, results of the of across the portfolio and also for the individual projects. Um, in terms of uh, for the last slide, uh, our uh, uh, the outlook and, and where we are. So our first fund, uh, the climate fund, is about 70% uh, invested, um, and we're looking to deploy the capital fully by the end of Q2 this year. And we're working on a couple of other um, structures like the Sustainable Motions Fund, which um, is also replicated the USAID guarantee and is pretty much similar in terms of structure as the climate fund, uh, but uh, but obviously looking at um, uh, different assets uh, in terms of the sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Um, I have mentioned already the Madagascar Landscape Fund, uh, which is a little bit different. It's a fixed income product through uh, a green bond to be working with the European Investment Bank. Um, and uh, another one, the Amazon Sustainable Cattle and Impact Investment uh, in Mato Grosso, which is typical, is quite an interesting one uh, based on one of our investments uh, in our current portfolio. We, we see the opportunity to, to scale an existing model um, vertically and create a dedicated um, vehicle just for that. So uh, in terms of um, outlook, we are quite uh, positive. We do see a lot of interest from our existing partners, 
uh, whether it's public or private, to, to an appetite and demand for this type of um, investable asset classes. So the interest is growing. Um, yes, there is a challenge on, on scale, um, but um, through the new partnerships, through programs you have probably seen um, uh, last uh, September in uh, Hawaii uh, IUCN Congress, a new part coalition launched around uh, around this. Um, just recently at Davos, the UBS uh, announced uh, a new platform, impact platform. So it, it's it's we really do see a lot of interest and 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 and, and growth despite of the difficult political uh, environment. Um, and we 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 do feel that uh, there is um, yeah quite a um, a good potential to grow uh, as the reports uh, also concluded um, and um, I'll probably stop here and, and look forward to answering any potential questions. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much Edit for uh, your resourcefulness giving a, a great presentation under under duress and um, with that we will move on to, uh, to a bit of Q&A so I'd encourage everyone to um, submit any questions you may have uh, and we'll go ahead and get to them in the last several minutes. I'll go ahead and open the floor with this one. Um, this is most likely directed to Kelly. In the case of food and fiber, uh, more specifically agriculture, is it possible to disaggregate the data by commodity or crop type? Uh, and is that disaggregated data publicly accessible? Uh, great. Um... Okay, great. I want to make sure I was not muted. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so unfortunately, it <laughs> I think I'll have disappointing answers. So uh, we basically the, the the lowest, most detailed um, measure we took was just whether or not the investment was in sustainable agriculture. So we did not um, collect data at a level where we could um, disaggregate it by crop type. Um, this is, I, I think, mostly just because these surveys are completely voluntary, so we try and make them as painless as possible for the respondents um, to provide data, and especially when you're asking for data across different types of conservation and across multiple years, um, there's only so detailed you can get um, with that. Um, and unfortunately, it is all um, confidential data that was that was given to us, so uh, this, the level of, of disaggregating data to the sustainable agriculture investments was sort of the lowest level that we could get without um, breaking confidentiality. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, we've already heard some uh, some qualitative uh, observations from our panelists. Um, you know, Adam spoke to the fact that investor education is no longer as much of a necessity. Um, I was wondering if, if, if either Adam or Edit could speak a little bit more to um, just sort of qualitatively whether you've noticed increased interest in conservation investments or you know sort of restoration investments in the case of Adam in the last few years or, or any other trends you want to speak to? I, I can um, say a couple words about that. Um, I, I would say that um, there has been a real uh, a shift in the interest of public sector entities um, that want to essentially purchase restoration results, um, not necessarily as compensatory mitigation, but simply for the regional environmental priorities that are uh, uh, that are pressing in that in a, in a particular locality or region. So, our industry learned its skills, the physical, uh, you know, planning. Uh, engineering, design, permitting, and execution skills of doing restoration in the mitigation banking arena. But now, because of issues uh, often uh, related to climate change and sea level rise, um, there is much more discussion of green infrastructure, resilience, uh, adaptation. These are all words that, at the end of the day, mean that restoration is needed someplace. Some physical activity has to happen on a piece of land, uh, and so for that to happen, there are a set of you know, real estate investment and execution and operational skills uh, that must follow in order to get things done. And while 
the private sector focus has been and still is on compensatory mitigation under the Clean Water Act. The skills and capability of the industry um, are now being put to work in other areas. Um, and, and there are numerous examples now of essentially requests for proposal or RFPs that are going out from government entities to simply purchase or procure uh, environmental restoration for its own sake or for the benefit that it accrues in a particular location. So that's the big picture observation I would have is that there's a movement from um, the customers being interested just in compensatory mitigation and moving instead towards uh, restoration outcomes for, uh, for different purposes. On our side, to uh, maybe to complement that, uh, operating in a little bit uh, different area or niche of the conservation, let's say finance, um, so on the tropical forest um, conservation part, um, it has been quite challenging and for our first uh, funds close, which was in 2013, um, that has been quite a yeah, unique or first of its kind, um, the carbon markets at that time uh, tumbling and however since in the last, uh, let's say, three years we, we definitely have seen that um, again thanks to the fact that, you know, um, you, a diversified revenue stream model for example what we apply um, it's still possible to make a, a, a you know a good track record and investable um, investable um, uh, cases or, or yeah, I'm sure uh, profitable investments. Uh, we have seen we have seen a lot of um, interest again from our existing partners, but also some new uh, investors that that are are very interested in this type of type of products. Um, very interested to replicate the, the conservation notes, uh, bonds, and so, so we, we we really see a, an, an an increase in the in, in from investors um, with, with obviously with some of the challenges you mentioned and scale and uh, aggregation and etc. Um, but the, there there is that. Yeah. Um, a growing interest to many investors, and and you know the this is also backed by the the science, the climate change target, Paris agreements. We need to, we know that the need for um, you know stopping deforestation is really uh, necessary to achieve uh, with any likelihood the two degree target, etc. Thank you, Adam and, and Edit. So with, um very interesting comments. I, I want to direct this next question uh, to Kelly. Are there plans in the future to have a survey question on the actual IRRs achieved by investments? Uh, this would be a fantastic data source to use to increase the confidence levels among institutional investors. Uh, so yes, um, that is an interesting question, Jim, and the answer is actually we did include a question around actual IRR achieved um, in this survey and I, I believe it was also included in the original survey that was held back in 2014. Um, I think, so we, we didn't get a, that many respondents uh, to that question. I, I think we had 16 organizations provide information um, and I think that the the value is, is certainly would, would be really high because I think that to your point there still sort of is this um, lingering concern among institutional investors that they fear that impact investing isn't going to give, you know, similar or maybe even adequate returns. Um, I think being able to collect that uh, is something that we will certainly keep trying to do in the future and might become easier over time once uh, respondents to the survey become more familiar with us and um, trust sort of our methods and our confidentiality. Uh, since this is only the second survey, I think there's probably still some respondents who are a bit hesitant in providing us with all of their data. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, another quick question just on, on methodology. Um, how much data came out of Canada specifically? Is, is that disaggregated from the North American total? Yeah, I, I just double-checked that really quickly because I didn't know it offhand. We only had uh, two respondents provide data from Canada. so. Um, you know, as I was mentioning, at, I think at the end of my slides, this might not mean that there aren't more, but just that those were the only two that responded to our survey. Um, 
so not a whole lot, but something that we are certainly going to try and improve on in future iterations of the survey. Sure, great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and then this question I might pose to the field is an interesting one. Um, given how many organizations use their own indicators, is there any value add on using standardized indicators, uh, or are there tools and platforms that can facilitate the communication of these indicators? This is Adam. I mean, I, I think I mentioned in my comments that we roll up the ecological performance of the various investments we make into very high-level sort of gross indicators of value, uh, acres conserved, miles of streams restored, and so on. The details uh, are too different from one another. Uh, on a project-by-project project basis to allow for sort of easy categorization. And I'm pretty sure the work that I do and the work that Edith does result in very different types of measurable activity on the ground as well. So apart from high-level indicators like the number of acres affected, it's not, uh, it's not obvious what sorts of things would be most interesting to investors or other stakeholders. Thanks, Adam. Um, um, just to add a, a couple of thoughts of my own as well, we've um, earlier this year I was involved in a market study that was looking at um, demand for uh, ecosystem services, and um, I think that was something that sort of we ran into. We were we were trying to interview potential buyers of ecosystem service, you know, offsets or the like, um, and one of the interesting things that sort of came up was that it seems like a lot of buyers still are interested in making sure that there is actually a conservation impact, but when it comes down to the details, a lot of them aren't necessarily that picky. Um, and similarly, if, if you are interested in exploring this more, we had another report come out, um, I believe last year, that looked at co-benefits of carbon specifically, and um, my uh, former colleague, Ali Goldstein, wrote that, and one of the interesting findings that she found, I think, was similar that a lot of, a lot of organizations are sort of interested in the big picture, but that there were some sort of savvy buyers who were interested in, in very specific outcomes, but that sometimes that would be written into uh, the contract itself of, of what specifically they were interested in. But I think this sort of gets back to the point of there's a lot of different things you can measure, and there's a lot of different uh, measurements that might be of interest to various buyers. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that it's 11.03 now, so um, I'll, I'll quickly give my outro spiel and then uh, just solicit any, any parting words from our panelists. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of Kelly and Forest Trends Ecosystem Marketplace, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to our panelists, uh, Adam Davis from Ecosystem Investment Partners and Edit Kiss from Ecosphere Capital Partners, LLP. Uh, for lending both their time and expertise this morning. Uh, for all the attendees, if you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to download the new report, which can be found at forest-trends.org. Um, I also see that we have a few additional questions we haven't gotten to yet today, but I will do my best to direct those to the proper panelists and, uh, and, and get some private feedback back to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll open the floor to any parting thoughts from Kelly or Adam or Edit. Uh, none from me. Thanks very much for the opportunity, and have a good day, all. Same yes, here. Thank you all for. Uh, oh, go ahead, edit. <laughs> yeah, same here. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure, and uh, look forward to any further questions or continuing this discussion. And I'll I'll echo echo the thanks to everyone. And and if anyone does have additional questions and you didn't uh, submit them in the question box, also feel free to just send me an email. Uh, it's khamrick at ecosystemmarketplace.com. Great. Thanks all. Take care.